So in this video, I'm going to go over problem number one from the 1986 AP Physics C E and M AP exam. So here's what the problem stated. It had three charges producing the following equipotential field with these equipotential lines as shown, and they're labeled with the voltages, that is the electric potentials, I should say. And we have a number of different points that are labeled on here as well. So part A is to draw arrows at points L, N, and U to indicate the direction of the electric field at these points. So there's point L, there's point N, and there's point U. So here is the result of doing that. Notice a number of things about these arrows. First of all, they are all pointed directly outward from the potential lines. In other words, they are normal to the potential lines. That's one of the rules that electric field vectors are normal to the equipotential lines. The reason for that is because the electric field vector is the negative gradient vector of the scalar field. The scalar field here being the electric potential itself. So E vector equals negative grad V and gradients are always perpendicular to the scalar fields that they are taking well the gradient of and that is something that is just a general result the gradient being what you would call a covariant vector in this case and the gradient vector itself is going to be perpendicular to the scalar field that it represents. So these are all perpendicular. Second of all, notice that the vectors themselves are pointing in the direction of decreasing electric potential decreasing electric potential. So the electric field, remember, it tells you the direction that a positive test charge would move. Well, it's going, a positive test charge would move from higher potential to lower potential. Just as a massive particle is going to move from a region of higher gravitational potential, um, which means higher gravitational potential energy, to a region of lower gravitational potential energy. So, in other words, down in, in the case of most places on Earth. Third, notice that even though the arrows point in a direction that is perpendicular to the line from which from the of the point from which they emanate, they are not always perpendicular to every other equipotential line. In other words, if you were to draw, the, say, like the 45 volt equipotential line in between here, it would, it would probably not be perpendicular to the tip of this vector. In other words, the vector is only perpendicular to the point that it's representing, which in this case is on the 50 volt equipotential line, or over here on the 30 volt equipotential line, or for point U on the 0 volt equipotential line. It is not representative of any other equipotential line. So uh, what that means in terms of physical results is that if you were to release a positive test charge at any of these points, it would accelerate in the direction that the vector is pointing, but that does not mean that that's the direction it would actually travel. If it already had some velocity, it would actually be moving in some other direction. This just tells you the direction of the acceleration that it had when it was at point L. So just as when you throw a ball in a parabolic arc on Earth, the acceleration vector is always down, even though the direction of the motion of the ball might be some other direction. In addition, unlike the situation with gravity, in this situation, the electric field is changing quite noticeably with position, whereas at least if you're close to the surface of Earth, then the gravitational field does not change noticeably, um, at least as long as you don't change your height by a reasonable fraction of Earth's radius. So even at the top of Mount Everest, the acceleration due to gravity is something like 9.76 meters per square second. But in this situation, the electric field is changing quite noticeably with position, both in terms of magnitude and in direction. Well, what about magnitude? Well, that's where we're going to be dealing with part B. Now, I do have some notes right here of just what I mentioned verbally, so if you need to catch up on some of that, you might want to pause the video and read through these. Moving on to part B, however, I've kept the picture with the arrows that we've drawn, and at which of the lettered points is the electric field greatest in magnitude? Well, lettered points <clears throat> means the points, all of the lettered points, not just the ones that we've labeled. So what we want to do is we want to search for the point where the 
slope is steepest, so to speak, because ju just think about gravitational field. The gravitational field is going to be strongest where the gravitational potential energy is changing the fastest. Well, in this case, where the electric potential is changing the quickest, that's going to be where the electric field is going to be the strongest. And even just eyeballing this, you can kind of tell that it's like if you look off toward the right, it seems like you're starting to go go down into a hole here, a really deep hole. And so, yeah, indeed, the electric field is strongest at this point T right here. This is the point where the lines are closest together. That's how you can explain that. The equipotential lines are closest together, which means that's where the electric field is uh, the strongest. The uh, the electric potential is changing the fastest, meaning that the electric field is the strongest at this point. Now, it turns out you actually would have gotten some credit here if you had uh, listed point U, because they decided to be merciful on students who could not properly read directions and simply interpreted the question to mean of the three labeled points that they had labeled in part A, and so they gave credit for people listing point U among those. But, yeah, I mean, you got to read the directions more carefully. Other years, maybe they wouldn't have been quite so merciful, and it would definitely be point T. So here is the picture again, in case you need it for your reference, that showing just in enlarged view of what we were just looking at. And indeed, the gradient here is very sharp, and that's where you're going to have the largest electric field. Now moving on to part C, computing an approximate value for the magnitude of the electric field E at point P. Well, here we can actually try to make a map. Remember that the electric field vector is equal to the negative gradient of the electric potential. So at least in terms of some sort of positional coordinate, you would have that the electric field is equal to the negative derivative with respect to position of the electric potential. So like negative dv ds, where little s is our um, just normal spatial coordinate that doesn't necessarily have a well-defined um, x, y, and z that's already predetermined. So in this case, since we're trying to determine an approximate answer, the idea is that we're going to say that, okay, at point p, which is right here, we want about the negative delta v over delta x. In other words, E equals negative dv over dx or ds, which means that approximately, as long as the electric field isn't changing too sharply here, which it doesn't appear to be. In other words, the distance between the 30 and 20 equipotential lines is about the same in this region as the distance between the 20 and the 10 equipotential lines, and similarly between the 30 and the 40 in this area. So it, the electric field is not changing very sharply here. We don't have any reason to think that it suddenly starts to go up right here as it's going down to 20 or anything like that. Um, so we can approximate the electric field as being negative delta V over delta S, and how do we get the, those numbers? Well, delta V is just the difference in potential between here and here, and delta S is the distance between here and here. Now, why that distance? Well, because that's a distance that's easy for me to measure. What I can do is I can make kind of a ruler um, approximating this 10 to the minus 2 meters that they give us down here, except I tilt it in the direction that I know I want to go here. And I notice that I have two of these metrics between my 30 volt equipotential line and my 20 volt equipotential line. So since there is a change of 10 volts, in fact, a change of negative 10 volts over a distance of 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, we can compute an approximate value for our electric field. So we have our delta x, or delta s if you prefer, being 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, that is 0 0.02 meters, and delta v, technically delta v final minus initial is negative 10 volts, but they're looking for a magnitude of the electric field anyway, so we simply have 10 volts divided by 0 0.02 meters, and we get 500 volts per meter or 500 newtons per coulomb if you prefer, but the units themselves showed up very nicely in our calculation here. Another good reason why you should always make sure to plug in your units in your calculations. Now, for part D, 
what's the approximate value of the potential difference Vm minus Vs between points M and S? Well, Vm minus Vs. So we need the potential at point M minus the potential at point S. Well, it looks to me like point S is about halfway between the 0 volt and the 10 volt equipotential. And I don't know, maybe it's a little bit closer to the 10 volts, or maybe that's like 6 volts, but I'm going to call it 5 volts. So Vm, that delta V is Vm minus Vs, and Vm is 40 volts, and I'm saying that Vs is about 5 volts. So we have that potential difference as 35 volts. Now, for part E, determining the work done by the electric field if a charge of 5 picocoulombs is moved from point M to point R. So let's see, we have point M right here, and we have point R down here. But remember, whenever you're dealing with a conservative force field, and the electric field is indeed a conservative force field, you already knew that, right, though, because you calculated an electric field based on the electric potential. And for those of you who have had some multivariable calculus before, you should hopefully remember that one of the hallmarks of any conservative field, conservative vector field, is a field in which it is possible to write that field as the gradient of some scalar field. And that's how we estimated our electric field at point P. So it is definitely a conservative field. And another, the, the whole thing about conservative field. It's a conservative field if and only if it can be written as the gradient of some scalar potential. If and only if the work done from one point to another point is independent of path. Well, since we have the scalar potential here, we can also say that the potential at point R right here is the same as the potential basically at point N. So all I really need to do is go straight out from here to here. So that's how you would do it if you had some sort of function that you were dealing with in terms of calculating this. Well, we do have a function, we just don't know what it is. So it's easiest just to look at this conceptually. So we realize that the work is the negative of the change in the potential energy. That is always the case when you're asked for the work done by a field. The work done by a field is always equal to the negative of the change in potential energy in taking the particle from point A in the field to point B in the field. Well, we have the potential energy at point R, well at least we have the electric potential which is just as good as you're about to see, and we have it at point M. So I'm allergic to negative signs, I like to get rid of them as soon as I can, so I just distributed this through and flipped it around. So the work done by the electric field is U at point M minus U at point R. So, well, what is the ele electric potential energy at a point? Well u equals qv. That is an equation that you should definitely have memorized. The electric potential energy of a point charge at a point of known electric potential is u equals qv. So everywhere I see a u, I plug in a qv, and since it's the same charge, the same 5 picocoulomb charge, I factored out the q, and now I just plug in my numbers. So now I go back to my tape, my drawing here, and I have point R right here is 30 volts, point M is 40 volts. So we write those down among our givens. We have the charge being given, and now we plug in our numbers. And the result of doing that gives that the work is 5 times 10 to the minus 11 joules, or for those of you who love Greek prefixes, that would be 50 picojoules. Now, what about part F? If that charge were moved from point M first to point S, and then back to point R, would the answer to part E be different? And if so, how so? Well, we already discussed that. Remember that work is independent of path because of the fact that we are dealing with a conservative force field. And we know that we're dealing with that because we were able to determine an electric field based on the fact that it is the gradient of a scalar field. In this case, the negative gradient of our electric potential, which is indeed a scalar field. So, since the vector field is conservative, the work is independent of path, so it really does not matter how we go from point M to point R. In fact, as we mentioned in part E, we could have even moved point R anywhere along that equipotential line, or done the same to point M. 
So that is the end of the solution to problem one from the 1986 version of the AP Physics C E&M exam. So let's go back to the beginning and see where all they awarded our points. So first of all, in part A, drawing these vectors, one point was given for all vectors drawn with the correct sense, that is from higher to lower potential. One point was given for all vectors drawn perpendicular to the equipotential lines. And one point was given for showing all vectors at all three of the points. Now, with part B, the saying that the magnitude of the electric field is greatest at point T earned you one point. And for mentioning that that's because the equipotential lines are closest together near point T, which in my language I use the density of the field lines is greatest there, that's the same thing, that gives you a point. So five points so far. For part C, computing an approximate value, well, you got one point for listing the magnitude of the electric field being delta E over delta X or delta S. You got one point for correct substitutions, that is one point for noting that delta V is 10 volts, one point for noting that delta S is 0 0.02 meters, and one point for the correct final answer with units of 500 volts per meter and I'm not sure whether or not they would have given you this result, full points, if you had not listed your units when plugging in the numbers, because if you hadn't listed them in the givens, you would have needed to list them in plugging in the numbers. So another good reason always to plug in your units when you're doing your calculations. But if you're doing things properly, you're usually only going to have to do that once, because remember we like to get our final answer in terms of variables only first before we plug in our numbers. So on part D, calculating the approximate potential difference. So this was simply worth two points for writing it, just plugging in the numbers and getting the overall final answer of 35 volts. And they, they actually gave you a plus or minus two volts in the number. So if you decided to call that point, um, six volts, for example, like might, might have been the case, they, they allowed you to do that. Okay, for part E, they gave you one point for the equation W equals Q delta V. In this case, we derived it, but um, if you just listed it, that would have been fine. Actually, my mistake on that, they, they wanted you to list it and then plug in the numbers. So one point for plug, proper plugging in of your givens with units and one point for the correct answer with units. Actually, two points. So I'm, I'm guessing that they gave one point for the magnitude of the answer and one point for correct units. Or maybe one point for the magnitude, at least having the five there with units and one point for the correct power. Sometimes they do it like that, that 10 to the minus 11. And finally, in part F, they gave one point for the correct answer, that it is no, because work does not depend on path. So that's it for our going through the solution for problem number one of the 1986 AP Physics C electricity and magnetism exam. If you have any questions, please let me know.